Hello fellows, Mr. Creepy Creeps here. If you are new here, you can subscribe our channel. We upload daily horror videos. I had been working as a private detective for three years when the most bizarre case of my career landed on my desk. A mother and father were worried about their missing daughter, stating that she had joined some new religious movement and hadn't been heard from since. What's the name of this religious movement? I asked, a deep feeling of unease rising in me. They call themselves the God Machine, the mother said. I tried asking her about it the last time I saw her, but she was elusive. Wouldn't answer any of my questions either. She just said her boyfriend had already joined and gone to live with the fellow believers, and that she would be following in his footsteps. Do you think your daughter has in reality joined a cult? I asked. Her father nodded gravely. It sounded like a cult to me, Detective Larson, he said. They refuse to talk to people who leave the cult or who aren't part of it, except for the recruiters and leaders, of course, who have to talk to outsiders so as to grow their little nest. He rolled his eyes slightly at this, his frown deepening. And they keep them in this huge complex in the middle of the woods. I've tried looking around, but their security is extremely tight. He handed me a piece of paper with an address scrawled on it. I'm afraid that Chrissy may be, well, dead, or may be kidnapped. We haven't heard from her in over six months. I nodded, taking notes. I'll find out what I can, I replied, not having much hope of recovering her alive after so much time had passed, but not saying it out loud. She is an adult, and sometimes, in cases like this, we end up finding them living in a different area under another name. There is no need to assume the worst. Her family was wealthy, and they were willing to pay whatever it took to discover her fate and bring her back home if possible. After all, they still had some hope. There had been no bodies discovered, and she really could just be living off the grid somewhere. <laughs> so I've been thinking about joining up with your religion, I said to one of the leading members of the cult, who introduced himself as Dax. He nodded, his eyes a cold gray color. He smiled wide, but the smile didn't touch his eyes in the slightest. Getting an appointment to meet with him was relatively easy, as they seemed interested in converting new members as fast as they could. Oh, we don't really call it a religion. We think of it more as a spiritual movement, a gathering of friends around a common purpose, he said. The God Machine allows a way to directly experience the divine. It is what every religion promises, but we actually deliver. We want to show this gift to the world as soon as it is ready for it anyway. Until then, we are just building up a small crew of like-minded individuals, including perhaps you. His face turned serious as he looked at me. So what is this machine anyway? I asked. Is it something that alters your brainwaves? Or... He made a hand gesture like he was shooing a fly away. No, nothing like that, he said. You'll have to experience it for yourself. There is no way to communicate what exactly the God Machine is. Even to call it a machine is just part of the limitations of language. But take a look around the complex and get to know some people. I smiled, rising from the chair and leaving the office. As I shut the door behind me and began going down the hall, I noticed strange paintings and poetry on the walls. The paintings were actually very good, but nonetheless, they looked eerie. Some of them showed countless eyes, others were of something with four faces, one facing in each direction of the compass. The faces were all horrifying to look at, massive fangs with saliva dripping down from its gaping maws, and pure black eyes that seemed to stare into me. Wings like those of a dragonfly with strange symbols burned into them, protruded from the robed body. At the top of the painting, I saw the words, My Soulmate, The Angel of Death written in calligraphy. Intrigued, I read the poem beneath it. The Angel of Death. Takes my heart out. She's beautiful and young, eternal. My heart drips. Her mouth opens wide. The blood runs free. She shows the truth, eyes flashing. She smiles wide, mind knowing. Where she takes me. I always want to go. The sweet rotting burial ground the place where we all meet. She is my lover. She does what? No one else can. It's all I crave. 
the sweet grass, the smell of dirt, the worms eating away. This old skin and the worms sing and sing. Just two words. You're home. Well, that was disturbing, I whispered quietly. I stopped looking at the artwork and poems after that. I smelled something delicious down the hall. The clatter of forks and knives drew me to a dining hall where dozens of people sat. Most of them were young. They weren't all dressed alike or wearing any identifying insignia. It could have been the dining hall of a college campus, except for the paintings on the white concrete walls. I saw more paintings of angels with twisted smiles and insectile wings, black eyes and claws for fingers. I grabbed a tray and filled it with food. It was a buffet-style setup with chicken, steaks, pastas, fresh bread, fruits, coffee, and many desserts. I wondered who paid for all of this. They hadn't asked me for a dime when I talked to Dax. The thought occurred to me that they would try to indoctrinate people first before asking for money. Either that, or they had some mega-rich donors. The land this compound stood on extended for hundreds of acres, and the entire building looked brand new. I found a couple people at a table, a woman and a man, and I sat next to them. They smiled blankly at me, their eyes looking empty and tearid. Hi, I said, returning the smile. My name is Joe. They introduced themselves in turn as Alex and Mary. So how do you like living here? Oh, it is just beautiful, Mary said, her eyes seeming to stare through me. What we have here is like nothing I had ever thought possible. I tried experimenting with a few religions before I found this place, but it was all rituals and memorizing random bullshit that never helped me find any peace, and some of them were straight up scams. I tried joining Scientology for a little while, but they just kept asking for money. Alex nodded. If you want to see what makes this place holy and unique, wait until after lunch, Alex said. We're going to run the God Machine, and it's mandatory for all new people to attend. You're going to see everything for yourself. I bet in the future this place will be a site of pilgrimage for millions of people. A small glint of fear seemed to pass through him as he told me this, but it was gone in a moment. They proceeded to talk about the trails and wildlife while I ate, and before I knew it there was an announcement over the intercom. Will all members please gather in the Great Hall? I heard the voice of Dax say before cutting off suddenly. Everyone rose a murmuring susurration echoing through the hall as the low chatter of so many people combined into one noise. I followed the crowd through the winding, endless hallways of the complex until we came to a room the size of an auditorium. What I saw at the far wall made my breath stop. It looked somewhat like an archway but not one any human ever built. It had dozens of black strands of organic-looking tendrils that intertwined the entire way to the topmost point. Each of the tendrils was the width of a pencil, and they all seemed to shiver slightly, sending unified waves running through the exterior of the machine up to the top. The only thing I've ever seen close to it were from science fiction movies. My brothers and sisters, Dax began, scanning the room slowly. Some of you know what we have here. We call it the God Machine, and we follow what it shows, and we see the truth. But it is no machine built by humanity. I doubt whether humanity will be able to achieve this level of technological success within the next hundred years. Nods of agreement spread throughout the room. I stared blankly at this madman, not knowing where he was going with this rambling introduction. He moved closer to the God Machine. If you do not wish to see what is contained here, now is your last chance to leave. We will not hold it against you. No one left and he pushed his right hand into the vibrating black strands of the archway. They began to glow white. The light spread up and down throughout the entirety of the arch, and the interior portal began to fill with blinding colors. Deep blacks mixed with blood reds, tropical blues, and vibrant greens. Everyone stared deep into the doorway, hypnotized by the colors mixing and shimmering there. The smell of ozone and sulfur began to fill the room. Some of the cultists had a look of ecstasy in their eyes, others a look of sheer and total terror. One of the cult members, a chubby young man standing in the corner, fell down to the ground suddenly, his eyes rolling back in his head as a seizure overtook him. Then I felt it. A presence was watching me from within the archway, 
short beams of lightning filling the doorway as it zoomed forever within itself into a fractal vision. Red, glowing eyes filled the machine, starting at tiny pinpoints and then expanding to fill the portal. These burning eyes kept growing until they overtook the wall of the room, then seemed to continue growing until they took over the entire sky and then the observable universe. In that moment I saw eternity, and I trembled, nearly collapsing from the horror of it all. The shimmering light rushed into the room, so bright I could no longer see the other cult members or the walls, or anything, besides the emanations from the archway. I felt nausea rising within me, and I expected to either collapse or start vomiting at any moment. Joseph Larson, the fractal light said to me in a very slow, deep voice filled with power, rushing like a waterfall through my ears and overtaking my mind. I couldn't think. I could barely remember who I was. I felt my ego dissolving, a primal terror filling me beyond anything I had ever imagined. Beyond the colors, I saw millions of legs on the body of the thing, writhing and moving like the body of an infinite centipede, its eyes filled with hatred and coldness beyond anything I had ever imagined. Its consciousness seemed reptilian, insectile. It was the type of presence that could kill billions of people, wipe out entire planets and feel the greatest joy at its destruction. With every dying star it must have rejoiced. Why do you come to me? The voice asked from everywhere and nowhere. I don't know, I whispered. I want to go back. Of course you can go back, it said to me, but I created you. I am eternal. I am the eater of worlds. Where will you run? With a single thought, I can send the angel of death to take you. I thought God was supposed to be loving and compassionate, I said. He laughed, a disturbing sound like the grating of metal. I covered my ears, closing my eyes against the pain until it passed. You are all my slaves, it said, and when you die, you will simply return to another body to die again. There is no heaven. I created you simply to watch you suffer. Being alone for eternity can drive one a little bit mad. I felt my sanity slipping and fell to the ground. At that moment, the leader of the cult must have pressed his hand back into the archway, turning off the god machine. In a blur, I saw the lights draining away, like water down a drain. The room turned back into its previous look, a fairly empty auditorium with just an alien archway and many people in a semicircle. I found myself on my hands and knees, and a couple seconds later, I was throwing up all over the floor. After it had passed, I looked around again. Some of the cult members in the room were on their backs, looking up at the ceiling and crying. A couple others had bad nosebleeds, and they were on their knees, trying to keep their heads back, their eyes still vacant and shell-shocked. But the chubby man who had fallen early looked worst of all. As Dax sobered up from the experience with the god machine, he shook his head, like a dog who just left a freezing cold lake and walked towards his fallen cult member. Dax put two fingers on the man's jugular to check his pulse, then licked the back of his hand and held it over the man's mouth, trying to feel the smallest sensation of breath. He shook his head again. He's dead, he said. I was still bleary-eyed and pale from the experience, but at least now, I might be able to find out what they did with their dead comrades and what happened to Chrissy. For the cause this man gave his life, Dax said, motioning down to the corpse. He died for the highest purpose imaginable. To connect human and divine is the goal. If we can succeed, we will save billions from death. This eternal cycle of annihilation. A few of the cult members had tears in their eyes, but the rest had emotionless, vacant expressions on their faces. And like all of us, in the end, we will give the human shell to the angel of death, so that the angel may pass over us and leave us in peace for another night. Dax turned to a young brunette to his right. Have you called the high priest in yet? She nodded. Archon is on his way, she said haughtily. At that moment, an extremely tall man walked in through the door, one that I had never seen before. He had on a silken, silver-colored robe that seemed to grab light from the room as he walked, causing it to shimmer all around him. But it was his face that was most memorable. I involuntarily breathed in a gasp as I looked at him. 
He had multiple surgical modifications to his face and mouth. His lips had been split down the middle, healing so that small flaps of skin hung separated beneath his nose. He opened his mouth to greet Dax, and I saw his tongue was also cut, looking like the tongue of a snake. All of his teeth had been ground down to vampiric points and covered in silver. As if reading my mind, Dax turned to look at me, smiling broadly. Archon, this is one of our newest members, Joe Larson, he said, motioning to me. Archon turned, and I saw even his pupils had been modified to have an upside-down teardrop shape. I am pleased to see our movement growing, he said in a hissing low voice. I felt almost hypnotized as I watched the split parts of his tongue moving independently. His voice had a quality unlike any other human voice I had ever heard. There were sounds in his words that shouldn't exist. I stepped forward, shaking inside, and extended my hand. It is nice to meet you, Archon, I said. Archon grabbed my hand with immense strength. His skin felt like it was on fire, heat radiating out onto my palm. His eyes did not turn away from me, but simply observed me, reminding me of a slaughterhouse employee regarding his cattle. What do you want, Joe Larson? He asked me, raising one eyebrow slightly, holding my hand tight and refusing to release it. The heat that radiated off of his body seemed to be growing. I felt extremely uncomfortable. I wanted to yank my hand back and run out of there, screaming like a maniac. I took a deep breath, trying to control my shuddering body. I kept eye contact with Archon, knowing I could not exhibit any sign of weakness. The truth, I said. He smiled at me, a wicked and sickly-looking gesture. The truth, Archon replied, acting as if the word itself left a bad taste in his mouth. As Pontius Pilate once asked, what is truth? He let my hand go then, stepping back languidly as if nothing had happened. I had the sudden ridiculous urge to shove my hand in my pocket so he couldn't grab it again. Can I ask you about your changes, I guess? To your face? I said. Arshan looked bemused. It is only natural for new members to be curious, of course you can ask. Humans were never meant to speak Enochian the language of the angels, the language of the demons also since they were once angels. Many of the sounds used are impossible to vocalize with such weak bodies. Unless, of course, you can alter this shell, this body made of meat. I was born a man, just a man, just like you, but didn't Nietzsche tell us that man is something that shall be overcome? We must do whatever we can to overcome this frail worm of a shell. I have pushed myself as far as I can many times over. The scars of these surgeries are nothing compared to the scars of the mind. I have seen the angel of death, seen God. I have called upon the eternal ones, and they responded, greedily. Their appetites are ravenous. Like us, the angels must feed. They love human women, and they love the taste of fresh meat. But what they eat is not what you and I eat, my brother. Indeed, it is true that man is something that must be overcome, and I am that overcoming. I do not mind pushing this body to its utmost limits, if it means I can speak to the angels and demons, and even look into the mind of God from time to time. Archon finished speaking, looking around at the assembled cult members. Many of them quickly averted their eyes. Yet Dax looked at him with reverence and awe. Man is something that shall be overcome, Dax whispered to himself, and I heard the other cult members do the same parroting the same expression as it went farther and farther out into the room. Then Archon's lazy, pedantic expression changed, and he snapped to attention. Let us begin then, he said in a much deeper, gruffer tone. You two, he pointed at two random cultists in the corner. Grab Adam's body, bring it outside, the sacred fire should be lit. We will all meet in the back in one hour. Let us call on the Ancient Ones. Let us wake up the angel of death and give her sustenance. A few minutes later, I was wandering the hallways. The use of the god machine had stirred nearly everyone in the complex. It was as if a hornet's nest had been kicked. People were crowded in the halls, walking to their rooms or talking. A few were even singing, mostly in some language I had never heard before. It sounded like Sanskrit as if ancient Buddhist chants had been changed and given a low, guttural quality. Most of the members looked excited, 
but I saw one woman who looked absolutely terrified. I caught her eye in the hallway near the cafeteria. She looked at me for a moment, then her eyes became downcast. With her blonde hair and blue eyes, she looked absolutely beautiful. If I had to guess, I would have said she was no more than 20 years old. I walked up to her, introducing myself as Joseph. She hesitated for a moment. I'm Mary, she said. Were you with us when we turned on the God machine an hour or so ago? I asked. Her eyes widened. Oh, uh, no, I missed it, she said sheepishly. I've done it before. She leaned close to my ear. It was horrifying. I don't really want to do it again. That thing in the machine looked within my heart and showed me eternity. It showed me some ancient world where pyramids floated in the sky and spires rose into the clouds, some place where the angles weren't quite right and our world's geometry didn't apply. I ended up having a seizure and smashed my head on the ground. Then she leaned back, looking away as if she had done something wrong. I frowned. I didn't like it all either, to be honest. I said. That was one of the scariest experiences of my life. If I had to stay there for much longer, if I had to see that eternal thing for another ten minutes, I feel sure I would either be dead or insane. I shook my head. I think there are some things humans weren't meant to see. She nodded in agreement. But we are all required to go to the Angel of Death ceremony tonight, she said. Dax gave an announcement. Though in reality, Archon runs this place. Dax just passes on whatever he thinks Archon wants. I paused, wondering how much I should ask this woman. She seemed like one of the sweetest and most genuine people here. It was hard to believe she had joined such a cult. I had a feeling if I was going to find out what happened to Chrissy, then I would find it out from her. How did you end up in the God Machine? I asked. She made eye contact, giving a small half-smile. Family. She shrugged. Archon is actually my half-brother, though his birth name obviously isn't Archon. He changed it a few years ago, after some really intense experience with the God Machine that left him in a catatonic state for a few days. He wouldn't talk or move on his own or speak or anything. We had to feed him through tubes. He just lay in bed staring at the ceiling like a statue, and when he came out of it, he said God had revealed to him many things, including his new name. I felt my eyes widen involuntarily as she spoke. Holy shit, your brother. You look and act nothing like him, I said. Just as I felt we were entering into a rhythm of conversation, it was broken by an announcement that rang through the hallways. Everyone head out towards the back fire pit, Dax said. The ceremony is about to begin. You are all expected to attend. The tinny, echoing announcement spat static for a second and then died off instantaneously. Mary smiled up at me, taking my hand. Will you walk me out? She said. I nodded, feeling her soft hand underneath mine. It felt so different from when I shook her half-brother's hand. It didn't have the feverish heat, the pulsating energy that seemed to emanate from his skin. On our way, pushing through the rapidly thinning crowds of people in the hallway, I came to another part of the complex I had never seen before. A poem on the wall, written in calligraphy, caught my eye. Impurity eats away at a man, like rust through metal. Without a foundation, his mind falls apart. Wisdom builds up a man, like strength everlasting. With a foundation, he soars to the heavens. Life is hard, filled with suffering, ending with death. The darkness closes in, around his chest. The darkness presses in, and it seems eternal. Yet for one who sees truly, there's nothing. Next to it was a painting of a wide-eyed skeletal man, his mouth opened in an eternal scream, his body covered in blood. Darkness surrounded him on all sides, seeming to press in on and suffocate the figure. Do you like it? Mary asked me shyly. I wrote it myself, and I did the painting. I did most of these paintings here. It was very unique, I said. Did you write the other poems around here too? She nodded. I realized we were about to be alone in the hallway. Not wanting to be late, we hurried out the back door, Mary leading the way. It was beautiful out there. The warmth of spring reassured me. The smell of flowers and grass carried in the soft breeze. 
A large river babbled, and beyond it, a dark forest stretched to the horizon. The sun had nearly gone, leaving us in twilight and shadows. The cult members gathered in a semicircle around Arshan, who stood on the banks of the shore. A large fire pit stood next to him, shooting out purple and blue flames. We quickly found a spot at the edge of the circle. I saw the dead body of the cult member laying next to Archon. The ceremony will begin, he said. Anyone who does not wish to see what we have to offer should leave now. Then he turned his back on all of us, straightening, his silver robe sending off luminescent sparks in the darkness. He began to talk, but it was in no language I had ever heard before. It reminded me, in some ways at least, of Tibetan, but it had a hissing, gurgling quality that didn't exist in any language I had ever heard. His voice rapidly deepened as he chanted. The fire grew taller, sending out clouds of black smoke and changing from purplish-blue flames to dark gray ones. I watched him, and with horror, I realized something was happening on the other side of the stream. Where there had been a forest only moments earlier, I now saw an ancient city. The angles seemed all wrong, as if it had been built using a type of geometry foreign to our universe. Pyramids that looked hundreds of stories high blotted out the moon, and as I watched them, I realized they floated in the air, huge behemoths that resisted gravity as if they weighed no more than a dandelion seed. They looked like they had been covered with shimmering obsidian, reflecting the stars off of their surface. Twisting spires of silver and gold surrounded them. Floating orbs of fire lit the streets, moving up and down gently in the wind that flowed through our world and into theirs. Archon began to speak faster and the vision crystallized, but it was no longer just on the farther shore. Something was coming towards us. It was in a blood-red boat, one that looked like it would have been at home in ancient Egyptian times. Archon had stopped speaking, and the cult members were so quiet that not a sound louder than a breath emanated from the group. All I could hear was the subtle splashing of the oars as the strange being in them methodically pulled them back, lifting them up and putting them back into the dark water below. I grabbed Mary's hand again, feeling a sudden sense of fear and horror overtaking me. I didn't know what was coming, but it was something I felt should not be here. Arshan got down on one knee, his head bowed as the boat pulled up to our shore. The thing inside got up with twisty, jerking movements, its bones and tendons creaking loudly the entire time. I saw its head had been twisted 180 degrees to face backwards. The skin on its neck was still intact, but it was also contorted. Folds of flesh were stuck in a permanent spiral pattern, from whatever catastrophic injury had damaged its head. The Angel of Death, Archon said, so silently I could barely hear him. She who looks forever backwards. Even though the being's eyes were facing backwards, it had no problem navigating its way out of the boat. It moved in an eerie way, first so slow it barely moved at all, then in a blur so fast I didn't even see its limbs for a moment. Within seconds it stood next to Archon, putting one skeletal, emaciated hand on his forehead. He looked up in reverence. It hissed something at him in the same gurgling language that he had spoken. His eyes widened in terror for a moment. He tried to pull away, to get up, to free his head from the iron grip of the being. Then in a flash, it clasped its hands on the top of his head, twisting it around and breaking his neck. The snapping of bone reverberated like a gunshot in the utter silence of the night. He fell slowly his backwards head looking in my direction for a moment as his pupils dilated and his mouth fell open. An expression of total fear that would forever be embedded into his surgically modified face. The angel of death threw his body into its boat, causing it to rock and send out waves in every direction. It then bent down and grabbed the other body, the cult member who had died during the god machine ritual, and threw it on top of him. The semi-circular formation of cult members was rapidly breaking apart. Looks of horror overtook the faces of all those present, and I knew without asking that none of this was part of the ritual. Turning her body away from me, the Angel of Death looked directly at me. Her eyes were covered in a thin film of blood, her mouth gnashing constantly, showing sharpened teeth and a flicking, snake-like tongue. The rag she wore on her skeletal body blew slightly in the wind, 
and a smell like rotting tomatoes and putrefying bodies carried on the breeze towards me. Without even realizing I was doing it, I started backing away, still holding on to Mary's hand. With a skittering, jerking motion, the horrifying creature began to run at the cult members, and they scattered like cockroaches, running in all directions as death itself approached them. In the chaos that followed, I heard only screams and the ripping of flesh. I had found Mary in the press of bodies and pushed her forward, towards the edge of the crowd. We have to get out of here, I said, sweat pouring down my forehead. She nodded, her face pale and anxious. I glanced back at the monster that Archon had called on before his death. Her backwards face on her broken neck stared directly at me, an inhuman grin spreading across her face. I turned towards the complex, hoping to find refuge somewhere in there before I could get the hell away from here. At this point, I didn't care about my assignment or finding Chrissy or her body for her wealthy family. No amount of money could convince me to stay here for another minute. Yet the complex wasn't there, and neither were the lights of the town on the hill beyond. Something had changed rapidly when the ritual went wrong. This side of the shore had somehow transformed into an extension of the otherworldly city I had seen on the farther side. More pyramids and statues extended hundreds of stories into the air. Windswept sandstone streets lead into narrow alleyways and past golden spires. Sacrificial temples with statues of unspeakable creatures in their antechambers flashed by. Some of the statues showed huge tentacled abominations with reptilian wings and powerful muscles. Others showed the Angel of Death, her head twisted backwards. And a few showed things that I couldn't even comprehend, less likely communicate. As we sprinted down the avenue of temples and statues, I looked back one last time to see the Angel of Death far behind us. She was approaching another cultist, a young woman. The angel's skeletal hands reached into the cultist's chest. With a spray of blood, I saw the cultist's heart being taken out. Reaching around her own twisted, sickly body, the Angel of Death opened her mouth wide and took the organ, still beating and dripping blood, into her gaping mouth. I saw the bloody red eyes of the angel roll back in pleasure as she chewed, letting rivulets of blood drip down her pale skin and soak into the rags she wore. Mary's soft hand found mine, and she pulled me away. Like a hypnotized person, I stumbled, still staring back at the horrors that these cult members had unleashed, and then we ran into the city. Soon we found ourselves alone, the screaming and cries behind us fading rapidly. We sprinted down the main street for what felt like miles. A dry, desert wind blew through the ancient city. I didn't see another living soul in the massive place. What now? I said, panting, bent over. Mary had stopped too, breathing hard. She looked like she might fall over. I put my hand on her shoulder, steadying her. She started to cry. I don't know, she said. My brother is dead. Something must have gone wrong with the ritual. This has never happened before. Usually the angel just takes the dead bodies we give her and leaves. She always whispered something in Enochian to Archon on her way out, something he would write down in a journal. A few times, though, she also brought living people back with her. My eyes widened. Living people? Why? This disturbed me far more than anything else she had said. But Mary just shrugged wiping a few tears from eyes and straightening up. She seemed to rapidly regain her bearings. I've asked Archon and he has no idea, but if they're still alive, they should be somewhere in this city. I nodded, wondering. I had a terrible feeling about the entire thing. Why would these ancient or immortal beings need living humans? Did you know a woman named Chrissy? I asked, thinking back to the meeting with her family in my little office a few days previously, though it felt like months ago now. They showed me some photographs of her. I had a couple copies in my car, but that did me no good. A pretty brunette, tall, hair parted in the middle, has piercings all up and down her ears. Mary looked at me suspiciously. Yes, I know her, or should I say knew her, Mary said. She was one of the living ones the Angel of Death took back with her. A sacrifice of sorts, I guess, she had been gagged and drugged by Dax and the others in charge. Apparently, Chrissy was going to leave and spread the news of what we had to the entire world, including the suspicious deaths caused by the God Machine and the Angels. Most of all, 
She thought everyone should know that we could prove the existence of God. They tried talking her out of it, and she had acted like she agreed, but later the same week, one of the sentries on the edge of the property caught her trying to sneak out in the middle of the night. That was when they decided that she was a loose end who needed to be dealt with. I never supported any of this, you understand, Mary said, pleading, her expression sad and slightly angry. But they don't listen to me. I felt sick to my stomach. We kept running. Do you have any idea how to get back to our world? I asked between panting breaths. I was getting tired and would soon need to rest. Mary shrugged. I think if we took the Angel of Death's boat back to the farther shore, it would bring us where we wanted. The old myths say that the boat is itself a conscious, living entity, and that if you tell it where you want to go, it will take you there. Or maybe you just have to think it, I don't know. Mary stopped, bent over. I need a break. From behind us, high in the air, we heard a banshee-like shrieking, followed by a hissing noise. I looked up and saw the twisted face of the Angel of Death. She had unfurled a pair of black rotting wings. In her hands, she held Dax. Oh my God, Dax! Mary cried instinctively. The Angel's backwards-facing head snapped to our location, looking down on us from dozens of stories in the air. She dropped Dax. He screamed the entire way down. With a sickening crunching of bone, he landed on the sandstone street a few hundred feet behind us. The angel languidly pumped her wings, hovering for a moment. Then she began to chase us. Where do we go? Mary asked. I looked around. Next to us was a temple with a statue of a huge human with horns and terrible black eyes. Its hands and feet were clawed and animalistic, and it had a grin of pure sadism and lunacy carved into its face. From behind the statue, through the antechamber, I heard the echoes of a cry for help. It was in English and it was clearly a woman. Here, I said, getting under the cover of the marble entrance as fast as I could. At least in here, I thought to myself, the angel of death can't come down on us from the skies. The antechamber led to a room that was so large, I couldn't see the ceilings or the far wall. Torches lined the perimeter. In the middle, a bed had been set up, something that looked like it had been plucked straight out of ancient Rome. Inside the massive chamber, I heard crying of such abject pain that I thought it was some sort of monster, that I had been fooled into thinking it was a human. But as I looked closer, I realized that a half-naked woman lay on the bed, looking extremely pregnant, her legs swollen and her face round. Though she looked far different than the pictures I had been shown, I knew instantly who it was. Chrissy, I said. She looked up, her face drenched in sweat. She gritted her teeth. Please, she said, kill me. Then, as I watched, something inside her belly began to move, shoving its face and hands into the skin of her belly. With horror, I watched the skin begin to rip, sending rivers of blood running down her body and drenching the stone floors below. What is that? Mary screamed. What is inside her body? The angels, Chrissy said, her pupils dilating as her adrenaline spiked and she bled to death a pallor overtaking her skin, want human women for sex. It is a Nephilim. It grew so fast, and now... Her words dissolved into sobs and screaming. The small claws of the hand started to rip the muscles and organs of its mother. She rapidly lost consciousness as liters of blood flowed from her shredded arteries and veins. What came out of her body was indescribable. Its horns were as long as its head, curving back and around like the horns of a ram. Its eyes were sheer black, its pupils no more than slits. It had a kind of soft, downy hair that covered its naked body. Disengaging its jaw like a snake, it showed dozens of fangs and began to run at us. Though it was much larger than any human baby, it still wasn't yet as fast. We turned and sprinted out of the temple, hearing the soft pitter-patter of its feet fall further and further behind. Once we reached the entrance, I held out a hand to Mary. It's not following us anymore, I said. Listen. She cocked her head to one side, then nodded. But back in the chamber far away, we heard the sounds of ripping meat and chewing. The beast birthed from a combination of human and angel was consuming its own mother. 
Well, I said, frowning. We can't go in and we can't go out. What now? As if hearing my question, the angel of death flitted down slowly in front of the entrance, her face turned towards us, grinning from ear to ear. Blood still stained her teeth and chin. She whispered something in that hissing language Archon had called Enochian, then changed to broken English. More food, she said. More fools who think they can call us like dogs. You aren't leaving here. Ever. Her wings began to beat furiously, taking her back off the ground. The smell of rot emanated from her wings, mixing with the dry desert smell carried on the wind. Mary and I tried to get around her, but like a reptile grabbing an insect from the air, her arms shot out in a blur and grabbed us both by our necks. She cackled, a grating, hissing sound that filled me with fear. She began to squeeze so hard that I saw stars. My vision began to turn white. I felt sticky blood running down the back of my shirt where her claws were digging into my skin. And then, just as I thought all hope was lost, the Nephilim ran out. He was already much larger, likely from eating the body and drinking the blood of his own mother as a first meal. He stood as tall as a man, but was still naked, the downy covering over his body still showing. With a blur, he crashed into all three of us, causing the angel of death to drop us. I went flying, hitting the sandstone streets and getting the wind knocked out of me. Mary flew and hit the wall of the entrance, crumpling into a ball. I groaned. A cacophony of shrieks and rending flesh began immediately behind me. With a foggy head, blinking fast, I saw the Nephilim tearing into the Angel of Death. His clawed hands scored deep gouges in her back. Her mouth opened wide, and she bit into his shoulder. He let out a scream that shook the dirt from the buildings. It was so deafening that my ears were ringing. It was more like a high-pitched siren than any human scream, and likely had as much power as one. Crawling slowly, I went over to Mary. She was just opening her eyes, looking dazed. I slapped her gently on the face a couple times. Mary, Mary, I whispered. Can you hear me? She blinked fast, then awareness returned to her eyes. She stared straight at me. This is our one chance, I said, getting close to her ear. We need to get to the boat now. She nodded, standing up on wavering legs, and we began to move as fast as we could back in the direction we had come. The shrieks of battle between the Angel of Death and the Nephilim followed us back the entire time. I tried to block it out, thinking only of getting home. Finally, after hobbling along as fast as we could, I saw the river up ahead. Dead cult members were strewn all over the ground. Some had their chests ripped apart, while others had their heads snapped off. A few had their necks broken, their faces turned completely around, just like the Angel of Death's. Trying not to look, we hopped into the boat and I grabbed the oars. I began to paddle. Boat, bring us back to Earth. Bring us to the God Machine, the place in the town of Union where we came from, I said, hoping it would work. But, for good measure, I also thought of Earth. I thought of that building, the poems all around it, the paintings, the beds, the cafeteria. Up ahead, the floating pyramids and huge temples seemed to waver, looking for a moment like mirages in the desert. Then they disappeared and the complex came into view. I sighed heavily. Mary hugged me, laughing and crying at the same time. As soon as we were on the shore, I jumped out, helping her do the same. And we got out of there, vowing never to return to that place again. I might have failed to bring back the body of Chrissy, but at least now I can tell her parents what happened to her. But who would ever believe me?